Hello, my name is Marnie and this is Jerry. On behalf of Spyderco, we'd like to thank you for purchasing our new model 204 Triangle Sharpmaker. It is the next generation in a long line of Spyderco sharpeners. It's our goal with this video and the accompanying instruction book to help you get the most out of your new Triangle Sharpmaker. We've arranged this video to closely follow the instruction book. What we could only show you with pictures in the book will be covered with live action here. You're watching the introduction right now and in the next section we'll give you a brief history of blade grinds and sharpening. We'll also show you how to set up your sharpener and then how to sharpen a variety of knives including your serrated blades. Then following the knife section we'll show you how to sharpen all your scissors. When we're finished with scissors we have a whole section on shop tools and then some oddball items such as nail clippers and potato peelers. And once we've shown you how to sharpen everything, we'll finish up by demonstrating how easy it is to clean the sharp maker. But now, to show us how to use the sharp maker, we're very fortunate to have the founder of Spyderco, as well as the head of research and development department, Sal Glesser. Sal has been involved with the development of this sharpening system, as well as all of Spyderco's sharpeners, and he's undoubtedly the best person to show us all how to get the most out of our sharp maker. So let me introduce Sal Glesser. Morning. Hi, Jerry. Sal. Nice how you doing? Good great. to see you again. It's great to have you here to show us how to use this thing. Well, they said if I didn't do it, they'd take away my crayon. <laughs> <laughs> Sal, I'm really excited to learn how to use the sharp maker. But before we get started, could you give us a little history on where sharp can get started? Uh, yeah, it'll take a couple minutes to set up some uh, some stuff, and we'll get right into it. Sounds okay. Good. Okay. The the whole history of knives goes back a long way. Before we had fire, uh, we were cutting things. So a knife is actually man's oldest tool. They uh, started. Uh, back in the Stone Age with uh, using very hard rocks, essentially. This is a piece of flint, and the way they created the edge was by applying pressure with another rock and actually flaking off the pieces of flint. Uh, what you end up with is a sharp edge, which they used for, for cutting things. However, once the edge was gone, they had to go back to the knife maker and recreate the edge or sharpen it. And the way they sharpened it was the way they made the original knife was by flaking off the extra rocks. But, but the sharpening of the knife was a critical part of even having one. Another example uh, is here. These are um, from Kodiak Island uh, in Alaska. They're, they're predecessors to Ulu's. This is the cutting edge, and this is the way they were held. And they used them for skinning animals or scraping or cutting food. However, again, once the edge was gone, they needed a sharpening stone, and it's funny that these three pieces were all dug up together out of an old dig. Uh, mm -hmm. and, the, and this, rather than flaking it, what they did is they used the harder stone to actually remove part of the slate. And so they created their edge this way. And the edge could be created up to a certain a point, but the angle, which was very difficult to maintain, took a fair amount of skill. And even in modern days, we use uh, natural stones. This is an Arkansas stone. It's a, it's a piece of novaculite. And it's quite hard. It's harder than any metal, and so they can use it to remove metal. But again, you still had to maintain your angle. So if you were sharpening this way, if you changed your angle even a little bit, it changed the, the edge, uh, which made it even more difficult to try to maintain a consistent angle. So consistency became the, the goal. And about 150 years ago, people discovered that the inside of a crock pot, if you set your knife in there this way, you can see that, that the curve of the pot actually creates a consistent angle. And by running your knife on the inside of the pot, you could actually sharpen the edge consistently because the crock was harder than the steel and you could actually create an edge. Now this concept went a little bit further. A man named Louis Graves um, created uh, a piece of, uh, of porcelain, very much like this, only more modern, and, um, and the V-shape is designed to maintain consistent angle control. And the way that's done is if you were sharpening this way, let's turn that stone up a little bit, and now we keep the blade straight up and down. And the straight up and down visual is the way we maintain the control. Now from the early 70s on, a whole slew of various kinds of V-sharpeners came into production, eventually ending up with this. This is the triangle sharp maker, the one that we produce, and it's probably the most sophisticated and the most versatile of the sharpeners on the market today. And again, the technique is keeping the blade straight up and down. And I'll show you how to do that in a few minutes. But it's the edge that we're concerned with with a knife. Okay. 
Um, it, now there's a variety of different kinds of grinds that they'll use to create an edge. Um, there's four basic grinds. One is called a hollow grind. And that's where they take your basic piece of steel and using two wheels, they hollow out a portion. Uh, this is a hollow grind and you can see where the, the steel is actually hollowed out on both sides. Oh, okay. Uh, and that's how you end up with an edge. Mm -hmm. A second type of edge would be called a flat grind, and that's where you start at the top and you just go straight to the edge. It's easier to see coming down one side and down the other. Uh, a third type, which isn't used much anymore, it's, uh, it's a, a, a double convex grind where you come around this way. Sometimes it's called an apple seed grind because of the actual shape. Uh, back in Japan, they uh, they used to call it Hamaguri Ba, 800 AD. That's how far back this goes. But in all cases, what you're trying to do is get to the edge. Uh, there's another type that's been used quite a bit. Recently, they call it a chisel grind, but this has again been around for many years. You'll notice that on one side it's flat or sometimes even a little hollow, right. and the other side, it actually comes in this way. So you have the grind is just on one side. So what's the point of having different grinds? They're just different ways of getting to the edge. Um, in the case of a chopping tool, uh, that's where you would want that apple seed grind, like on a hatchet. You'll find okay. most hatchets are done that way so you can have a lot of meat behind the cutting edge so it doesn't break down. Okay. The hollow grind and the flat grind are the most common used today. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just two different, uh, two different solutions to the same problem, almost like Fords and Chevys. They have two different advantages. And the, the advantage of a, of a chisel grind or a catawba grind is that when you're cutting food, this part gets right up to the part you're cutting, and this part throws the food off to the side. Oh, okay. So, but in all cases, what we're trying to do is create a very sharp edge. And what I'm going to do next is show you how to use this tool on a knife uh, to create a sharp edge. I think most of us think a knife is just a knife. I know, it's amazing. Yeah, it is until it goes dull, and then you <laughs> throw it away and go get another one, right? Uh, with this tool, you can actually make the knife sharper than it was when it was new. Is that right? And it's quite simple to do because of the angle control that started back here with the crock pot. Uh, let me show you how this thing uh, works and, and what it's all about. This is the lid. Uh -huh. Everything is contained. There's four stones. There's two coarse stones. I'll explain those in a minute. There's two fine stones. Now, the easiest way to remove these is to grab the stone and just pop it out. Okay. And then these are the safety guards. Now, the stones come in coarse and they come in fine. They have uh, corners and they have flats. And we're going to use all four of those surfaces. So as I go through those, I'll show you. These are uh, brass safety guards. And we always want to make sure to, uh, to use the safety guards. Um, these will go right in here like this and your stones will fit right in here. Now your stones can go in either with the flat side facing each other or with the corners facing each other. And there's other positions as well. The reason this works so well is because they're so hard. And I'd just like to give you an example of just how hard they really are. If you took something like a file, which you probably think of as the hardest thing you own, and you tried to cut the stone, that black stuff is literally the teeth coming off the file. Wow. The stone is so hard that it will cut any It'll kind of off. metal. Jeez. In fact, we go a step further. This is a sharpening stone that's used to sharpen steel. Huh. And you can see that our, see it, yeah. our stone is actually considerably harder than this. This is a man-made stone. It's technically a synthetic sapphire, and it can be used to cut any type of metal. Now we're going to use four different steps or, or grits in order to get the knife sharp and just because it's faster. Okay. The first position that we use is the two corners of the gray stones. Now these don't leave a very good edge but they're quite rough and they, they remove the excess metal. So what happens when a knife goes dull is that you've actually removed the edge and rounded it. And now we're going to remove metal on both sides until we, we restore that actual edge. Okay. Now these will wear. This is a utility stone. 
and they will eventually wear. In fact, when they have a little bit of wear on them, they actually will cut faster. So when I get a new set home, or what you should do when you get your set home, is take one corner like the one opposite the groove and just rub it alongside the other one just to crack the surface. Okay. Once the surface is cracked, you'll find that it actually cuts sharpening. faster. It'll do it on its own anyway, but it'll do it faster yeah. that way. So step one is a corner of the gray stone, and we're going to use that to actually set our angles. And then we go, once we set our angles, we go to the flat side of the gray stone. Again, the same thing, but now we're going to work with the flat surface. This will make a knife about uh, sharp enough to cut food or paper. We call it a, a utility edge. It's about the way most knives come from the factory. Yeah. Step three is a corner of the white stone. That's a very sharp edge, butchers and barbers type sharp. And then step four is the flat side of the white stone. And that will give you a razor edge. Wow. Okay. Sal, on these, you always want to use the flat side with the flat side and the edge with the edge. You don't yeah. want to mix them. Right, right. The, the sharpening process is keeping the blade straight up and down. The reason we do that is because that's where your angle control comes from. Like we showed you with the crock pot that you have angle control. Imagine if you were sharpening a knife, it's difficult to see what that angle may be, but if we turn the stone up so that the angle corresponds to straight up and down, mm -hmm. And now you've got a, a visual control over that position. So when you're sharpening a knife, you're going to start at the back and you're going to pull it towards you. Then you're going to start at the back and pull it towards you. Well, this is a very simple motion. And once people get pretty good at it, they don't pay attention. Right. It's not the beginner that we worry about. And while we have guards there, it's the person that's already used it for a while. <laughs> uh, one possibility is this. Now that will surely cut your hand if that nice soft brass wasn't there to stop it. Sometimes people will do something like this. Or if you have a big kitchen knife and you pull it over and mm. do something like that. The guards are there to protect your hands and we would uh, like you to use them at all times. Okay. And now we'll get into actually sharpening um, some of these knives. And we have diagrams that in the book that show what a very coarse edge looks like and what a finer right. edge looks like, so on and so forth. Hey, let's get started. Okay. Um, the core stones are the ones that we'll use first, and I got the cameraman's knife, uh -huh. and uh, you, can, you can see where the sharks are biting at the edge. It's, <laughs> so we'll make it sharp. It's not very sharp now, but we'll make it sharp. With the sharpener a little below your waist works the easiest. Thumb on top of the blade, and what we're going to do is keep the blade straight up and down. The angle is already built into the stone, so as long as we keep the blade straight up and down, we're going to get a perfect angle. And we just start alternating stones, just like this. Go from the heel and pull it towards you so you come right to the tip. Now in the beginning you won't know when to go from one grit to the next mm -hmm. grit, so we have you counting strokes. Okay. About 20 strokes on each of the four steps and you should be shaving sharp. But I'll show you how to test each one. So that would be one, two, three, like that. Let's just give this a few strokes. We're cutting a little bit of steel off the edge of the knife each time we go down until we restore that edge. We're mm -hmm. going to bring that edge together. Okay. Now the easiest way to tell if you've brought the edge together is to set it on something like your fingernail. And if you can draw it all the way across without it sliding off, then you know you've set the edge. That's where that rumor came from about checking drag on your fingernail. It has nothing to do with drag. It has to do with seeing if you set the oh, edge. Okay. Now, ladies usually have uh, fingernail polish, and so that's not a good idea on the nail. But you can not use you can use the side of the sharpener, okay. even the lid. Uh, you can use a piece of Tupperware. But all you're trying to do is make sure that you brought those two sides together. Once you brought the two sides together, then you go to step two. That's the flat side of the gray stone, but everything else stays the same. We're taking, again, a little bit of metal off each side, but because we've gone to the flat surface, this kind of softens the pressure, which gives you a more refined or finer edge. And you're doing 20 strokes again? 20 on this. strokes again here. And that'll give you an edge that's about like a new knife. We call it a utility edge. You could call it a factory edge. And frankly, that's all my wife ever uses in a kitchen. Mm -hmm. She says, I don't need to shave tomatoes. I just need to slice <laughs> need to them. Cut hair. And, uh, and the, the gray stone will give you an edge that's actually sharp enough to cut paper or mm -hmm. cut food. Uh, then we go into the white stones. Now, the white stones are a professional grit. 
Uh, they're oftentimes used by machinists, by dentists, by a variety of people that really need a fine finish. Step three is the corner of the white stone. And just as we showed you before, the motion is the same. We're cutting a little bit of steel each time. Now with the white stones, you can actually see the steel because the steel is black. If you look right on the corner of the stone, mm -hmm. you'll see a black line forming. That black line is the steel that's coming off the knife. Now, if a knife is really dull, you can actually load up enough steel on one of these sections to where you've covered the surface. Once you've covered the surface, it won't remove metal anymore. If you feel that happens, it kind of goes slick on you. Just turn to another corner. Mm -hmm. When all the surfaces are dirty, then we just wash them out, and I'll show you how to do that when we're done. Okay. About 20 strokes here, and she should be sharp enough to shave hair. Uh, I'm supposed to tell you not to do this at home because this is dangerous, but you can actually shave the oh, hair yeah. off your arm with a knife. So this knife is actually sharp enough to shave hair. And then we'll go into the fourth grit, which is uh, the flat side of the white stone. And this is generally used for things that are already pretty sharp. If you mm -hmm. shave with a straight razor, go for it. Most people don't use straight razors anymore, but you use X-Acto knives, you use box cutting knives. There's a variety of knives that you, you would do that with. And again, about 20 strokes. One good test for this would be to see if you can uh, split a piece uh -huh. of paper. See, we're not cutting through the paper, we're yeah. just splitting it. And that gives you a very sharp, sharp and a very true edge because it's consistent from one edge to the other. And uh, that's how you'll sharpen all of your plain edge knives. So you said we're working at 40 degrees yeah. here. Why right. would you use a 30? This is 40 degrees because we found that that's the best compromised angle to work on any steel. Any knife will get razor sharp at 40 degrees. Right. Now some steels can be sharpened at a narrower angle. Sometimes in a kitchen, you might want uh, a thinner angle because you're only cutting soft food. Mm -hmm. We find that, uh, that if the edge is too thin, what happens is it breaks down. Oh. So we recommend the 30 degree angle for back beveling. And I'll explain that to you as well. See, it's a much narrower angle. Now let's say that your knife, when it was new, had about a 50 degree angle on it. That's really too wide. It's not gonna, it's not going to perform the way you would like it to, but it's, it's, it's fast and easy to do at the factory, and a lot of times they'll do it that way. So we create this 30 degree angle so that you can actually thin out the edge. So you're taking that 50 degree angle and you're really bringing it into 30 degrees. That way when you sharpen the bottom at 40 degrees, you have a nice transition. Okay. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And also if you take a knife and you sharpen it at 40 degrees over and over and over after a couple of years, you're kind of working your way up the blade. Eventually, the blade will be pretty fat. Mm -hmm. Again, that's where you would use your 30 degree angle again to thin out the edge. So sharpening your knife the same way over and over again can almost cause it to go dull? It's not really causing it to go dull, but as it gets fatter and fatter, you have more resistance trying to cut through something like food. Okay. So about every, oh, maybe 10th time that you sharpen your knife, then go into the 30 degree angle and just give it about 50 strokes the same exact way mm -hmm. and that will take the shoulder off of that cutting edge and thin it out to give you a better performance in the long run. Now some people actually sharpen their knives at 30 degrees and you can. Mm -hmm. It produces a very sharp edge, what they call scary sharp, mm -hmm. but, um, but it, most steels won't hold it. So if you're cutting on something hard like wood or, or you're cutting hard boxes, then that very thin edge will break down mm -hmm. faster. So. Uh, it's okay, you can do it, but the best thing to do is to try it and see if you like it. But mm -hmm. we recommend the 40 degree angle uh, as the ultimate uh, uh, all around angle for sharpening knives. Is that what Spiderco come at? Do you set them at 40 degrees? Actually, no, we set them a little thinner than that. Yeah. We have them from the factory, they're coming in at about 30 so that you can maintain your 40 without having to back bevel. But Spiderco is one of the few companies that pays attention to that. So Sal, can the sharp maker sharpen a serrated knife? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, we have some serrated knives here, and the, uh, the serrated knife is only sharpened on step three. Oh, okay. Because the fine corner of the radius of the white stone will allow it to go in and out of the teeth. Now you can use the gray stone, but the gray stones remove a lot of metal. 
And if you sharpen the serrated knife with the gray stone and you're going very quickly, then there's a good chance that you could distort the serration. Oh. So when you're sharpening a serrated knife, you do it the same way. The process is the same. The blade is held straight up and down and you draw it towards you from the heel to the tip. You want to slow down your motion though because you don't want to be skipping the teeth. Okay. Now here there's a couple of points of view and I'm going to give you both of them. <laughs> if you'll notice the serration is only ground on one side. The other side is actually flat. So the first way is to just sharpen it like a regular plain edge knife. One stroke on one side, one stroke on the other side. That will produce the strongest edge because it'll be 40 degrees. It won't be quite as sharp as that very narrow edge that it came from from the factory. Some people like to maintain that. Mm -hmm. The way to do that is to sharpen about three or four strokes just on the side that it was ground. Okay. Now what that will do is cause a little burr to form on the other side. So after three or four strokes on one side, just one stroke Take on the off. other side will cut that burr off. Okay. And that's the way you would sharpen one of the single bevel grinds, the katab or what we call the chisel grind before. You would take the side that has the grind and just do three or four or five strokes and then one there to cut off the burr. Mm -hmm. And that way you can maintain a very okay. sharp edge. With the serrated edge knife, what you're trying to do is actually sharpen with the inside of the, right. of the tooth. And that's what the stone allows you to do, get inside of there. Well, that doesn't look too hard. Can I try it? Sure. Okay. So I hold it just like I would to slice a tomato? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this mm -hmm. red? No, it's slower. Okay. There you go. You're right, this is You're easy. <laughs> wow. Great, thanks. Sharp. Sal, I've got a flexible knife I use for filleting fish. Is, will the sharp maker handle something like that? That's a good job. This is a, a fillet knife. It's quite flexible. Uh -huh. um, with flexible knives, we just use the corners of the stones. Because, uh, because the knife is flexible, it's pretty hard to stay on the flat surface. Okay. So you would use step one just to set your edge like you uh, would with normal knife. And as you apply pressure, make sure to stay even on the edge. So when you, when you get down to that, that edge, you have to kind of apply a little more pressure to one side. How much pressure do you apply? It's about three pounds, but uh, you'll actually feel it. It's just something, you got dragged. yeah, you'll learn to feel it. It takes about four or five knives to, to get the hang of a tool. After you've taken probably four knives from step one all the way through to step four, then the, the motion will become easier, uh, the, the straight up and down will become easier, and then handling something like this is just a matter of making sure you've got pressure right out to the tip because it's, it's the very tip of the knife that you want to have very sharp. It doesn't take a lot of pressure. You're not trying to muscle your way through you know, it. Pressing harder doesn't make it sharpen faster. So it, there is an optimum pressure. And that we find most people get that down pretty good. Okay. Good. I've had that knife for a long time, and it just gets duller, but I hate to throw it away. No, That's good information. I'm sure you can make it sharper than it was when it was new, and you can get a lot more use out of it. Okay, Sal, now I have a good one for you. I have an electric knife that just gnaws instead of slices. Can the sharp maker handle that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, again, it's a serrated knife. This is an electric knife, and if you'll look at them closely, you'll find they, they come apart. Okay. So, so they were we, meant to be sharpened. Right, right. Oh, okay. So you have a, a single bevel on this side, and then this side's flat. Take the side that's ground and do it just like a serrated knife. Now here you notice, Jerry, that it's it's a little flexible, so I'm applying right. a little more pressure so that I can get right out to the tip. Probably five or six strokes. And then just lay it right flat on there. The okay. other side, lay it right flat on there and just go right down. What that will do is cut off any burr that develops. Okay. And then you do the same thing with the other side, but because it's, it's ground on the other side, you'll sharpen the other side the same way. Sense. And then you'll just flatten it out on the other side the same way. Um, mm. Probably, oh, I would say 20 or 30 total strokes on each side will bring your, uh, your electric knife, again, sharper than it was when it was new. Gee, I thought I had them stumped. No. Sal, for the most part, we've been dealing with conventional knife blades. Will the sharp maker handle something like a hawkbill or a linoleum knife or a hatchet or something mm -hmm. like that? No problem. 
Um, hatchets are generally working uh, very hard, so it doesn't pay to use the white stone. You can if you were in a contest, you know, where you were racing somebody. Uh, but generally speaking, steps one and two will do it. And you'll do it the same way, starting at the rear and working to the other edge. And again, I would use the, the corner of the stone until it'll uh, catch your nail or catch the side of the sharpener. And then you go to the flat side of the stone and just uh, continue on the flat side of the gray stone until it'll cut a piece of paper. Okay. That's about as sharp as you're going to want to hatch it mm. because it's, if you start hitting wood, that very fine edge breaks down very quickly. For a hawk bill, uh, this is one of the few sharpeners around that will do it. And um, this one is serrated. So I'm only going to use step three, but if you're using a plain edge hawk bill, then you would use step one and three only. All right. Because you're working, you're working an inside curve, and so it really doesn't pay to use a flat surface. And you would do it the same way. Notice a little bit of twist at the mm -hmm. wrist, mm -hmm. just so that I can get the tip. Right. If you were doing a hunting knife, for example, that had a belly like that, and you were doing it the same way, then you might do a little twist up the other way. Okay. But with a linoleum knife or any of those odd knives that have that inside curve, then the, the corners of the stones would be the way to do that. Sal, I'm really impressed with the versatility of the uh, sharp maker system. I think I could probably sharpen most of these knives myself now. I really appreciate this. No problem, you're welcome. Okay, Sal, you said that the sharp maker can handle scissors, so I brought along several different kinds, some ordinary scissors, some pinking shears, and some thinning shears that my hairdresser asked me to bring along. Sal also brought a pair of tin snips. Can we handle those two? Sure, no, no problem. Let's start with the ordinary ones. Okay, if you look at the end of the tool, you'll see another hole is there. This is designed to handle a triangle, and if you look, there's an angle set there at 12 and a half degrees. You only use one stone. Basically, show you how we do this. Uh, and you would use steps one, two, three, and four, just like you do with your regular knives. Uh, I'm only going to use step four here just to show you how it works. Remember with knives, we kept the blade straight up and down. Yeah. Well, the same thing here with scissors. We're going to keep the blade straight up and down. Bring the tool to the edge of the table. That way you're not going to stab the table. And just as you do with a knife, go from the heel right to the tip. Okay. Over and over. And both sides would be done the same way. So just turn it over. The other shear oh, okay. blade is exactly the same. Just do it the same way. Now, while you're sharpening just on one side, as we did with our kitchen knives, it's possible to develop a little burr. Now, a lot of people just close the scissor, and that cuts off the burr. And that's OK. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if you want to get a little more specific, if you lay the blade right on top of the stone, mm -hmm and just cut the burr off. And just do that once? Well, once or twice. Okay. Yeah, as long as the stone is flat up against the shear. You don't want to be turning it up mm -hmm. this way or you're going to just take that edge right off. And tin snips would be done exactly the same way. This, um, the blade is held straight up and down and drawn across the stone from the heel to the tip. Both sides are done the same way, just like you do your shears. And there you may or may not want to take off the burr again. The choice is yours. Most people like to check them on a piece of paper. See if you can just uh, mm. do that. That's the, the normal test. One of the tests that I like to use is uh, take a piece of felt, pull it apart, mm -hmm. and you get a really fine fuzz. If a shear is very sharp, you should be able to trim mm. that fuzz quite mm -hmm. easily. Then you know your shear is sharp. For thinning shears, yeah, if you can sharpen those, my hairdresser will love you. I don't know how you're going to get all those individual little well, forks. Well, you don't do it that way. There's two, two uh, cutting edges. One has a little fork that doesn't do any cutting. Oh. That just grabs the hair to keep it from sliding out. Okay. This is the only side that you do your sharpening on. Oh. And you do that just on the flat surface. If you use the corner of the stone, it'll go in between, and that's not what you want. So you just use the flat side of the gray stone to set up the edge. And then you use the flat side of the white stone exactly the same way. Ooh. Just from the heel to the tip and just coming right across. Okay. And again, you can deburr using the same method of laying it flat and then just coming right across. Okay. Now, pinking shears are a little different. Yeah, those pinking shears are so dull, they just gnaw the material instead of cutting it. It's possible to put the stones 
right there. Oh. And this is higher than the top of the handle. Now with a pinking shear, you've got a flat surface on the bottom of both sides. Okay. That flat surface is laid right across the top. Mm -hmm. And just keeping it straight up and down, come right across from the heel right to the tip. Okay. And again, both sides are done just like you do your regular shears. Now I usually use the gray stones until they're sharp enough to cut a piece of paper. Just continue sharpening on the gray stone until they'll cut paper. And then I go into the white stone and I use the white stone until they'll, they'll cut a piece of felt or silk, something really hard to cut. Mm. Now there are some shears that have a, a very thin angle, whereas most shears would be set at 12 and a half degrees. Uh, a pair of professional barber shears, for example, will generally be sharpened at a much thinner angle. Mm -hmm. So rather than keeping the blade straight up and down as you would for a regular shear, you kind of lay it over until you find that angle and then just sharpen along that angle the same way that you would a regular shear. And again, you would deburr the inside the same way that just you would. Flat. Right. So you have to do that kind of by feel to find the yeah, spot Yeah, but in the blade. normally it's a pretty wide angle, so it's easier to find. Jesus is great. We're learning a lot. Sal, before we get started on the shop tools, uh, this is an old razor my dad had, a straight edge. Can we sharpen something like this? Sure. A little bit of education here. So uh -huh. let's uh, show you how it works. The uh, little hook at the back is so that you can hold it um, this way. Now, it's generally these three fingers and your thumb that are working the blade. The handle just kind of out there. Mm -hmm. It allows you to get to all the little areas that you need to. Okay. Uh, the only purpose of the handle is to protect the edge. And when you get one of these sharp, they, uh, you don't touch them. And I'll explain why in a minute. Um, if you look at it closely, you'll see that there's that hollow ground we talked about earlier. The spine of the razor is thicker so that when you lay it down, the angle created by the thicker spine is perfect at the edge. So when you're sharpening, you're actually leading with the cutting edge like this. You always lead with that cutting edge. You go back and forth, laying it flat until you get a pretty good edge, something that'll shave hair off your arm, for example. Okay. But at that point, it really won't do a good job on hair on your face. You have to strop it. And in the stropping process, what you do is you take the softer steel that this is made out of and you bring that burr out. And that's done using a leather strop. Some people will use a, a fiberglass or, or various types of strops are made, but I always prefer leather. And you strop the opposite way that you sharpen. You trail with the cutting edge. Mm. And what you're doing each stroke is you're pulling out a little bit of that burr. Now under a microscope, that burr might look like a briar patch but that's what works the best when you're shaving. But because it's a very, very thin burr, if you were to touch it, for example, with your finger, you would bend it over and you'd have to go back to square one, oh. even if you break it off. Okay, now that it's sharp, how am I gonna test it without having to actually shave with it? Tomorrow morning. I'll get it. We'll <laughs> see what happens. There to do it. Hey, thank you. Well, if you two are ready, let's round up some shop tools and get to work. Can we start with the chisel? Sure. Uh, in fact, chisels and planer blades are very similar. So let's work with the two of them together. Uh, you have a flat surface on the bottom and then that single bevel on one side. And that's what uh, they referred to earlier as that chisel grind on a knife. That wasn't really a chisel grind, it's because of this. Mm -hmm. Now generally, we'll work the area on the bottom. There's two little slots in the bottom of the sharpener and the stones will fit right in there. And that gives you a larger flat surface. Um, the first thing you want to do with a chisel or a planer blade is flatten the bottom. And this uh, doesn't require any special technique. It's just a matter of going across the stones until you've taken all the burrs and everything off mm -hmm. the bottom. Then what you're going to do is reproduce that angle, like there, and then from one side to the other, actually go across and sharpen okay. the entire blade. Now we have a, another way of doing that. You can actually put the guards in. And whether or not this is easier for you, uh, it depends on which you prefer. But here you can actually do it the same way. And with a, with a planer blade, you would do it the same way. You would first clean up the bottom so there's no burrs and you've got a nice flat surface on the bottom. Match your angle, go from corner to corner, just right across. Now I start with the gray stones and I continue using the gray stones until, like pinking shears, they'll cut a piece of paper 
and then I'll use the white stones until they'll shave hair. Uh, nice clean edge is what you want. It just makes it a lot easier to do the job. Mm. That looks great. My dad's a woodworker. Would this sharpen a wood gouge? Oh uh, yeah, you can do wood gouges as well. And here we've uh, even found some other tricks that we've learned from uh, from some of our customers. We've got the little grooves there that we use for hooks. I'll show you that later. But on something like a round gouge, for example, the corner of the gouge can be placed in the groove and you can mm. rotate all the way around. The inside of the corner is what you would use to go inside and clean up any burr that might have developed there. I've been using a belt sander for wood gouges, so I don't need to do that anymore. Well, a belt sander takes off a lot of metal and yeah. sometimes makes it hot. You get it too hot, you change the heat tree to the edge. How about things like paddle bits, uh, wire cutters, or router bits? Okay, let's get into those. Uh, now remember I showed you the material is very hard. It's capable of cutting any type of metal. Here in a situation like that, you would use it as a file. For example, on a paddle bit, the area that you're going to sharpen is here and here. Those are the areas that do the cutting. Now it won't cut your skin, it's just too smooth. So you can actually use your finger as a guide to maintain an angle, or you can slip it into a vise and uh, tighten it up and just do it that way. Um, just continue stroking until you've got your edge. Do all four strokes. Some people also like to get the tip. Uh, this one doesn't have a really sharp tip. It just oftentimes will come so that it just comes together without having a point and you can actually just create a point on there as well. Uh, on a router bit, I like to use the tool just because it makes it, uh, the, the base with the tool, just because it makes it a li little easier to work with. Uh, sometimes they'll be just like this. Sometimes they'll have a little uh, roller. In the case of a roller, remove the wheel. And uh, you would just lay the, the flute right over the top. Now these things oftentimes are grimy with, with all kinds of wood pitch. We found that ammonia will clean the wood pitch off. They'll come out clean as new. So just get a little jar of ammonia, throw your router bits in, let them sit in there for a few hours, they'll come out clean. Otherwise, you're just going to clog up the stone with the, with the pitch. And lay it right over the side, sharpen it while watching television. It doesn't require a whole lot of effort. Uh, just lay the flute right over the side of the stone, keep it flat, and go back and forth. Actually, you would use do both sides. Mm -hmm. How about no. something like screwdrivers? screwdrivers? Screwdrivers, well, screwdrivers don't need to be sharpened, but what happens is that when you're, when you're working with screws, oftentimes they'll, they'll, they'll bend or they'll, they'll lose their shape. They just change. Okay. And again, using your, your, uh, your vise, lock them into position, and using the tool as a file, just get right inside the groove uh, and, and clean off all the burrs that are, that are built up inside. With a flat edge screwdriver, uh, the same method works, but you're not trying to get inside the, the uh, Phillips part of the burr. You're just trying to, again, clean up the area here. Mm. So just flat across the top is all you're after. Oh, okay. And just continue to do that until it's, uh, until it's the shape that you want. Hey, Sal, the screwdrivers look great. Now I won't have to throw them away for another five years. Okay, now I have another one for you, Sal. Well, you mentioned wire cutters oh, as well. Let me okay. get those as well. Uh, here again, you've got a very hard stone, you've got a very hard piece of steel, but the stone is harder. The area that you're going to sharpen is inside here and inside here, the same as you'd use for a cuticle nipper, for example. By using your finger as a guide, it's possible to maintain a consistent angle because it won't cut your skin. Mm. And you want to make it sharp enough to cut a piece of paper. Hey Sal, the other day I was at my dentist and he was telling me he was looking for a better way to sharpen his dental tools. I told him that I would be working with you in the sharp maker, and he was wondering if the sharp maker would be able to sharpen dental tools. Yes, actually we, uh, uh, we sell quite a few uh, ceramic stones to dentists. Um, they're not always in this shape. We have a variety of different shapes that we produce, but with your dental tools, you're going to be using the stone as a file, and you're going to be using your finger as a guide, mm -hmm. so that you would um, set the, the angle and your finger in position and just go down the stone. It's better to go just in one direction leading with the cutting edge because you're less likely to be rocking it than if you go back and forth. 
any of the surfaces will work. Some dentists prefer the fine stone, some dentists prefer the coarse stone, so mm. they'll actually have to try both to see. Uh, a chisel would be that way, something, or a scaler, something like an explorer, you would use the little groove in the side of the stone and just handheld and rotate. Okay. You want to get as much uh, a rotation as you can all the way around. These are used for exploring and so they're not really poking uh, and scraping so much as they are just checking out things. Um, Sal, if we're doing pointed tools like this, can we do awls, darts, needles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I've got some examples here. Uh, there I prefer to use the base because again we're looking for consistency and by using the hole there, for example with a dart, you can keep it straight up and down just like you do with a knife as you rotate it and that will give you a nice concentric point and every time you go back it'll be consistent. The same would apply to an awl. Uh, just make sure to rotate it as you sharpen it and you'll get a nice clean edge. Now this is a carbide scribe but remember the stone is harder than carbide and you can actually sharpen your carbide scribes using the same method. Now you have some oddball items on here like clippers, potato peeler, cuticle clippers. How do you sharpen those? In each case, you're going to use the tool, the stone as a file, and you're going to uh, just work with the cutting edge. The, uh, the cutting edge is there. Now, you can keep it opened and work with your fingers on both sides, going back and forth, mm -hmm. which will get both sides. Or occasionally, I'll just work it closed. Put your finger on both sides and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't take too much. These are not really hard steels. Um, but the best way, again, is to, to see if you can cut a hair or a little piece of, uh, of paper. Uh, nails are pretty hard. If it'll cut paper or hair, it'll cut anything. A cuticle nipper the same way. You've got an angle there. You've got an angle there. Use your finger as a guide and just maintain your angle. Mm -hmm. Three or four strokes. Same thing on the other side. Just three or four strokes. It usually doesn't take much to, to clean these up because you're, you're going to maintain them. They work, most tools work best, all tools work best when they're sharp. Mm -hmm. And the longer you keep them sharp, the better off you are. Now this is an oddball that most people have and they're very inexpensively made. So they, uh, they don't come nearly as sharp new as they could be, mm -hmm. which is kind of a shame because it's quite an invention. But here you have two blades that are coming together. Um, they're ground from the top and that's usually where they stop. So more often than not, there's a little burr on the inside. So the first thing you want to do is get the stone up on the inside and just go back and forth like that about five or six times and that'll cut off the burr. Mm -hmm. And then just holding it like you were peeling a carrot from the heel to the tip. Just mm -hmm. sharpens both sides at the same time. Right. And they get very sharp. Uh, you'll feel the difference right away. It's a great tool. It's a shame they don't uh, really take them to the limit. Hmm. Sal, it looks like uh, hmm. the sharp maker can just about sharpen anything we ever want. Yeah, we've learned a lot today. Um, you want to do the hooks? Sure. That'd be great. Okay, there's, there's uh, different kinds of hooks. The very large hooks that they're using for, for deep sea fishing have a cutting edge here as well as the point. And so getting in there and actually creating a sharp edge here is part of what you're looking for. The point itself is done in the, in the little groove in the stone, and that can be just back and forth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're working with a very small hook, fly hook or something like, uh, like this, the, the groove is actually too large to create the kind of a point you're looking for. So you put the two stones together, and then right in the area between the two stones, mm -hmm. That's where you'll sharpen that. They come down to infinity, and you'll get a very, very sharp point. Great. So, Sal, what about the care and feeding of the sharp maker? How do you clean it? Well, it doesn't require a lot of maintenance. Um, there's not much that you can do to it. You're putting steel into the stone while you're sharpening. The only real maintenance is to remove the steel from the stones. Come here, I'll show you what I mean. Uh, the gray ones will hold a lot more steel than the white ones. I usually wash these when they're starting to get my hands dirty. And this, the method for washing the two of them is the same. Get a little scouring pad that you would use to scour your pots and pans or your dishes. Uh, any type will work. A little cleanser, abrasive cleanser, again, any type will work. And just simply scrub back and forth until the steel comes out. Um, you can also put them in a dishwasher. You can put them in an autoclave. Uh, you 
You can put them in an ultrasonic, that's what the dentists use. Anything that will, will clean the steel out will work. And uh, just a cleaning and uh, rinse them out, dry them, and go right back to your sharpening. That's the only right. maintenance required. No Easy. oil or water uh, when you're using them, so it's a, it's a nice clean system. Great. Let me show you how to put this thing back together. The little uh, slots on the side of the bottom are for one set of stones. They just snap in. And then the safety guards drop right in that little groove on the top. The core stones go in on top of the safety guard. Hmm. And the lid holds it all together. Nice and easy. Sal, this has been great. I sure learned a lot and appreciate it very much. Yes, thanks a lot, Sal. Well, thank you very much. Hope this sharpens up your lives. <laughs> thanks. Remember, you can use this video and the instruction book together or separately to guide you through the steps needed to sharpen whatever you need sharpened. The sections of this video closely follow the sections of the instruction book. We did that to make it easy for you to find the information you need when you need it. You can easily fast forward or rewind to any particular part you want to review at any given time. Please follow the instructions and really make the sharp maker work for you. And remember, safety first.